Well, hello everyone and welcome to MTP Connect and to our CTCM information session, the funding call for medical devices round one. My name is Libby Pierce and I will be your Zoom host today. And I will now be handing over to Dr. Duncan McInnes uh, to facilitate and drive the session. We have you there, Duncan. Thanks, Libby, and welcome everyone. It's uh, a very exciting opportunity to talk about this new program that MTP Connect will be rolling out with our program partners. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, MTP Connect acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders present today. Before we get into the meats of the presentation, I'd just like to uh, deal with some housekeeping. You can submit questions throughout this presentation uh, via the Q&A box, and we ask that you use that and not the chat box. You can submit anonymously by clicking the checkbox, uh, but we would, would just point out that if we're not able to get to your question uh, and it's submitted anonymously, we can't respond later via email. If you have the same question as somebody else, you can upvote that question by clicking the thumbs up um, thing and it will get lifted up and be more likely to be addressed. This webinar will be recorded and the slides will be published within 48 hours, but we will email you when they're ready to go. So there's no chance that you'll miss that. We will include some useful links in that email as well. You can also view the on-demand uh, video at uh, mtpconnect.org.au slash webinars, where you can also find our very useful webinar from November 2020 on how to write successful commercialization funding grants. The CTCM team uh, is, is led by Danielle Shand, who will be uh, familiar to many of you. Danielle has stepped across from her role as director of our BTB program. Uh, it's been my absolute privilege to be seconded into Danielle's team for the last few months to help her get this up and running. MTP Connect will be advertising for a senior program manager in the coming days. And I will go back to my substantive role, which is as Director of Stakeholder Engagement for New South Wales and ACT. Rounding out the CTCM team at MTP Connect is Kevin Rajasekaran, who joined us at the beginning of this year after doing a internship with us. Uh, and so it's fantastic that Kevin uh, accepted the invitation to join us full time. I'll also, I'm also joined on this by uh, a number of our representatives from our program partners, including Ian Burgess, CEO of MTAA, uh, Andrew Milligan from MDPP, and Dharmika Mystery from Cicada Innovations. Uh, later on, we'll move to a panel discussion, and Ian, Andrew, and Dharmika will have an opportunity to introduce themselves and their organizations. Before I get into things, I'd just like to introduce MTP Connect uh, as an organization. So MTP Connect is the industry growth center for medtech, pharma, and biotech in Australia. Um, we were formed in November 2015 as part of the federal government's Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources Industry Growth Centres Initiative, and, but we're an independent, not-for-profit organisation distinct from government. Our, our goal is to champion a sector-led approach to accelerate and boost the growth of the medtech, biotech and pharmaceutical ecosystem in Australia. And we exist to advocate, to promote collaboration, alignment and engagement and to drive innovation, productivity, and competition. As an industry growth center, our four key goals are to increase, increase collaboration and commercialization across the sector, to do things to improve workforce skills and management, to help optimize the regulatory and policy environment, and to improve access to global supply chains and international markets. And the way that we do this predominantly is by deploying cash into the sector. Since 2015, um, we've been successful in being awarded a number of MRFF programs and also deployed 15.6 million worth of growth centre funding across 40 projects. Um, the projects you can see here, the Biomedical Translation Bridge, which will be familiar to many people on this call, and the Biomedtech Horizons support 21 and 46 projects uh, respectively. The TTRA, which is the Targeted Translation Research Accelerator, recently announced the uh, award of 
the two research centres, one focused on cardiovascular disease and one on diabetes, as well as seven research projects. Um, clearly, the CTCM is what we're talking about today, um, but I'd also like to take some time to talk about the READY program, uh, which is going to be particularly relevant to a number of people on this call and has a, a number of things where people can access funded or uh, access to, to schemes. So three pillars to ready. The first is the commercialization programs, which includes the foundation partners, the medical device partnering program, which is a program which is open year round. Uh, the MedTech Actuator, which is a call for um, applications open right now. Uh, and Health, who we support in a number of different ways, who have one of their one day bright courses open for applications now and the George Institute's Health 10X, which will open for applications on April 1. Via Ready, we also support a number of fellowships, internship programs and mentoring programs, which includes the Bridge and Bridge Tech Industry Fellowships, APR Intern, the VCCC Alliance Program, GSK Internships and the excellent IMNIS Industry Mentoring Network in STEM program. The third pillar of READY relates to a very detailed sector-wide skills gap analysis that we have published on our website uh, and importantly funding for groups to put forward in a competitive process programs that address identified gaps. And for this audience, I'd like to highlight these programs as particularly relevant. Um, firstly, the Cicada Innovations Program around identifying unmet market need and clinical context. Cicada have a program running online on the 23rd and 24th of February, um, which I think would, could be particularly useful in putting together your application for CTCM. Uh, CF Pharma are running a, a, a program around quality management systems, which includes a free primer that anyone can access, as well as deep dives into GLP, ISO 9001 and ISO 13485. Those are separate courses, uh, which do have a small cost attached to them, um, but are excellent, very in-depth programs on those areas. ARCs will be running a program around designing clinical trials so that they meet the requirements of payers, as well as showing uh, safety and efficacy. Uh, and finally, BioIntellect will be rolling out their Ventura program over the coming months, which is a program all around securing investment and delivering a funding investment, a funding strategy. Um, we will send out some details on how to register for those uh, in the email that we send out um, after, this after this presentation. So I'd just like to take a little time now to put the CTCM into context and show where it fits in. Uh, back in 2020, the Medical Research Future Fund released their 2020 early stage translation and commercialization support grant opportunity. There were four streams in, in that opportunity, which included uh, funding to support preclinical medical research, funding for early clinical development of novel drugs, early clinical development of medical devices, and early stage development of digital health technologies. The first two streams were awarded to MRCF, which is their curator program, and stream four was awarded to Ant Health which is their and health plus program. The CTCM is a $19.75 million program, um, which over the four years will identify medical devices with commercial potential and support SMEs through early clinical trials. We're delivering this in partnership with our program partner, partners, the Medical Technology Association of Australia, the Medical Device Partnering Program, and Cicada Innovations. We're also joined by our education partner, the Bridge Tech Program, uh, and our infrastructure partner, Therapeutic Innovation Australia. And I'll talk a little bit more about the role of the partners as we go through this. So what's available as part of CTCM? There will be two funding rounds, one of which opens is, is this round one, which has opened obviously financial year 2022. And the second is funding round two, which will open funding rounds. 20, uh, financial year 2023. Successful projects can access between $250,000 and $1.5 million per project. Does require a 50% cash co-contribution, and that's very firmly cash, not in kind. 
Some of you may be familiar for, with some of the other schemes we've run, such as the TTRA, where in-kind has been accepted. This is very firmly cash. Um, the funding period is for no more than 24 months and it is expected that the cash will be used to support commercialization and development, uh, to support education and access to infrastructure to help develop your, um, your device. We will expect to see uh, your demonstrated capacity to match the cash co-contribution co that will be part of the, the process. The application process will be familiar to many of you who've applied for MTP Connect funding in the past, and it is this multi-stage process. Uh, the first stage is an expression of interest, uh, which is submitted um, as, a, as an EOI, obviously, uh, which are then checked for eligibility and reviewed by the selection panel. The purpose of the EOI is to be succinct enough, uh, not, not overwhelmingly burdensome on the applicant, but provide enough opportunity to understand whether the, uh, the program should go to the consultation phase. Um, the, uh, the application form is available on our website along with the funding guidelines uh, and is, is fairly, fairly self-explanatory, I think. It is reasonably succinct uh, and that is because we don't want it to be too burdensome. Based on past experience, generally somewhere in the vicinity of about 50% of EOIs will go through to the consultation phase. Uh, and that is where our partners, MTAA, MDPP and Cicada come in. Where applicants reach phase two, they'll be assigned one of those program partners for consultations, which will be held via video conference as required. The consultation process includes due diligence. It allows the applicant to address any EOI review feedback and take a deeper dive under a confidentiality agreement. No confidential information is ever given to MTP Connect. The confidentiality agreement is with your consultation partner. Uh, following this process, the selection panel will reassess applications and a short list of projects will move forward to the final application stage to submit a full proposal. And generally, again, we would expect about 50% of those that go through the consultation phase to go to full proposal. Uh, the full proposals will allow some expansion on the EOI uh, and provide a, provide a more comprehensive outline of the project. Um, the CTCM partner will collate and distribute any additional feedback from the selection panel meeting for the applicant's consideration when preparing that full proposal. Um, finally, the full proposal applications will be reviewed by the CTCM investment panel, which is an independent panel of experts against the selection criteria and the CTCM investment panel will then make recommendations for which applications are deemed fundable. For those projects that are funded, um, the infrastructure partner, Therapeutic Innovation Australia, will our partnership with them ensures that CTCM leverages their connections to the NCRIS funded facilities around the, the country. Um, there are a number of critical engineering, fabrication, prototyping facilities that perhaps companies aren't aware of and TIA's involvement will help facilitate awareness of what is available as well as facilitating access. We'll also work with the Bridge Tech program uh, and there will be an opportunity for our successful projects for one of their team to undertake that program. Bridge Tech program is a national professional development program that trains researchers or members of the project team on how to effectively navigate the commercialization pathway. Uh, it's a fantastic program, both in terms of what you learn and who you meet. Uh, I believe that 2022 will be their fifth year. Uh, having taken part in 2019, I can highly recommend it. In terms of eligibility for who can apply, um, this is a program for small to medium enterprises. So the applicant, the lead applicant must be an Australian business with an ABN. They must have less than 200 employees and be incorporated in Australia. We expect the project to involve development of a medical device. Um, there must be demonstrated capacity to match the co-contribution requirement. Uh, we expect to see evidence of technical or commercial feasibility. Um, this is not 
a, a program for uh, something that is simply an idea. We expect something to be at least TRL4. Um, you need to demonstrate legal rights, rights to access and use the IP, and you must comply with any administrative requirements around reporting and so on that MTP Connect outlines. Similar to previous programs, we have five selection criteria, and we expect that this will be a very competitive program. So it's not the case where you will be able to carry an application with considerable strength in one or, or, or two of these areas. To be successful, you'll need to have strength across all five. EOIs are due in the middle of March, so you do have a significant period of time to identify where you think you might have gaps and bring in additional resources to, to address any of, any of those gaps. So the five selection criteria around your challenge and your solution. We wanna see that you're addressing an un, unmet or underserved need. Uh, we wanna see a competitive advantage and we would expect that you have an understanding of the landscape around potential other ways of treating a disease. If you're developing a device and there might be pharmaceutical interventions, we want to understand what the uh, competitive advantage of your solution is. We also want to see the value proposition. In terms of technical merit, we're looking for innovative design features. Um, we're looking for the solution to be scalable. We want to see that you'll be able to make large amounts of this uh, and that it's safe. Uh, and we'll also want to see some feedback from stakeholders and clinicians saying that they think that the solution to the problem makes sense and that they would like to use something similar to what you're proposing. The project plan needs to have clear deliverables and outcomes, um, and it needs to be feasible, particularly in the 24 month period. Uh, and we want to see that the key risks are identified um, looking at applications from 2020 where we had people putting in things around how they were going to deal with COVID and thinking oh there's no need no, no chance they're going to need that um, clearly now that that's it's been very important that we did have that in place so identifying those key, key risks will be key and having mitigation strategies in place uh, we'll also want to see that any feedback you've received from various stakeholders investors and so on has been taken into account in terms of translation and commercialization, we're looking for protected IP in some way and a sensible IP strategy. We want to see a feasible business model and uh, Ian's going to talk to us in a minute about what that might look like. Um, and we want to see that this is something that could be attractive to investors. We don't want to see any programs that might come out the end of a CTCM program, a project and not have any way forward from there. Finally, we want to see a team that is experienced and has a proven track record. If you have any gaps in your expertise, maybe you would use the CCTM money to bring in someone to bridge that gap. Um, we want to see a diverse team of expertise. We want to see the clinical expertise, the scientific expertise, the legal expertise, the commercialization expertise, uh, and again, identification of where that might be missing. And we all want to also want to see that you have access to the infrastructure required to successfully deliver the project. And it might be that access to infrastructure is a way of accessing patients who might take part in the clinical portion of your program. So that's a quick overview. With that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and introduce Ian, Andrew and, and Dharmika. And I'll ask them each to, uh, to introduce themselves and their organization. So Ian, Andrew and Dharmika, if you could come off mute uh, and turn your cameras on, please. Ian, I'll ask you to uh, introduce yourself first, please. Thank you. And it's, it's great to be uh, participating in the webinar today. And we're really excited to be uh, partnering in this program. It's an exciting program and the contribution it can make to, uh, to innovation in Australia, I think is enormous. And, and we're, we're really excited to be partnering with the other partners um, who do such wonderful work in terms of promoting innovation in Australia. So MTAA, we're the Medical Technology Association of Australia. We represent companies in the medtech industry, 
uh, our members provide the vast majority of non-pharmaceutical products uh, that are used in Australia. So as the voice of the med tech industry in Australia, we work closely with the researchers, industry, uh, end users, clinicians, and government to ensure that patients can access the latest technologies. So our members range from the largest med tech companies in the world, many of whom invest in Australian innovation or collaborate with or assist uh, early stage innovators through to small Australian companies, including local innovators and manufacturers. So our members can provide the technical expertise and industry knowledge critical to the um, successful development of technologies and can assist in that development and commercialization process. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks Ian. Andrew, can you introduce yourself in MDPP please? Sure, thanks Duncan. So I'm Andrew Milligan from the Medical Device Partnering Program or MDPP. Um, MDPP is a national initiative of the Medical Device Research Institute at Flinders University. And it was established 13 years ago to foster collaborations between inventors, innovators, researchers, industry, clinicians and government to advance early stage medical device ideas. Uh, now, for the last three years, MDPP has also been a partner of MTP Connect in the delivery of MRFF funded grant programs to support medical research commercialization. And some of you here today may well know me from our interactions previously in the Biomedical Translation Bridge Program. Uh, I have over 10 years experience in life sciences commercialization, including in government, university tech transfer, industry and a CRC. Um, I and the MDPP team of innovation and commercialization experts have assessed over a thousand ideas for new medical device and assistive technologies. And we look forward to participating in this program and providing support and mentorship through your CTCM journey. Fantastic, thanks Andrew. And it's great to have MDPP on board again. Dharmika, do you mind introducing yourself and Cicada please? Yeah, sure. So I'm Dami Kamistri, Head of MedTech and Biotech at Cicada Innovations. Um, and we're the home of Deep Tech in Australia. So we've got a 20 year track record of developing deep tech uh, ventures and tech who are tackling some of the world's most pressing problems. And basically, we've got this amazing incubator um, down in Everly, Sydney, where we support um, all of these ventures and innovators with cutting edge labs, access to mentors and experts commercialization training and other sorts of programs and events that bring everybody together. And of course, our family of experienced and ambitious um, founders and peers in our building. So we are here to support um, all different parts of the community. We're pretty much a melting pot of entrepreneurs, policymakers, research, and of course, the public. Um, and we've been involved with working with MTP Connect to deliver the Ready program, part of the Ready program, as Duncan mentioned, um, nationally. And we're really excited to be supporting this one too. Thanks everyone. It's, it's a really great group of partners that we have on board for this program and it's a, a mix of sort of tried and tested partners with MDPP and some fantastic, really exciting new, new, new partners with MTAA and Cicada. Andrew, I'm going to kick off with a question for you. The CTCM will fund clinical stage medical device projects. Can you give us some information on what counts as clinical stage in this context? Sure, yeah, and this is a point of difference, I guess, between CTCM and the prior programs like BTB and TTRA. So those funded projects, they could be preclinical or clinical development. CTCM is exclusively early stage clinical development. And by that, I guess we mean all projects, they must include a clinical investigation to assess the safety or the performance of a medical device. Um, in terms of its use in treatment, prevention, or the diagnosis of diseases in human subjects. Um, now, some product development, short run manufacture, testing of devices, et cetera, in the lead up to clinical testing will be considered eligible activities. But at this time of application, as you mentioned, Duncan, the technology must be at least at TRL4. Uh, and just to give you a definition of that, our definition, that is technical proof of concept and safety of candidate devices or systems has been demonstrated in defined 
laboratory or animal models. If it's not at TRL4, I would suggest that stream one of the current MRFF Medical Research Commercialization Initiative is a better fit for you. Uh, I think the stronger applications will be those that have fairly advanced preparations for a clinical study. Uh, and so what I mean by that, for example, is you might have produced a device technical file, prepared a clinical evaluation report and the study protocol. Um, so that would indicate that uh, you would be in a strong position to start commence a, a clinical study in the short term. Uh, now we get to the particular case of in vitro diagnostics, and we had there were uh, we had several applications for IVDs in BTB, so they, they were quite common. They have their own particular uh, requirements. In this program, a minimum requirement for eligibility will be the conduct of a clinical performance study. Uh, so that's using clinical samples that you may access through biobanks, for example, um, or you may be recruiting patients into a study as part of the project. So that will be the minimum. You won't be working with plasmids and antigens anymore, but with clinical samples. Although even better would be a prospective study demonstrating the clinical utility of the IVD. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. And yeah, I would just reiterate Andrew's point there that we have in fact funded a number of IVD projects through both BTB and the BMGH program. And so if that's where you're working, we do definitely encourage applications in that area. Dharmika, the CTCM program aims to support early clinical development of medical devices with commercial potential. Can you talk to us about what constitutes an unmet medical need or underserved need? And following on from that, what do we mean by competitive advantage? Yeah, so I guess an unmet clinical need is one where there is an identified gap or deficiency in the current delivery and practice of healthcare. I think the important thing that distinguishes that from just a general gap is that you have um, identified this gap by gathering data insights and also considering the current solutions on the market so that you've got this fully scoped understanding of the problem at hand and the impact of the gap. So a competitive advantage um, is what sets you apart from everything else that is out there on the market. So a solution that truly solves a problem for a user and is better than anything or anyone else. Um, but I think the part that's really important is identifying the gap first is meaning that you're identifying the problem to solve before developing a solution. So that's in our world called the problem solution fit. And it's the first stage of any idea development. Um, at Cicada Innovations, when we meet early stage innovators, we get people to really stress test their problem solution fit as a first line of validation. And by that, it means, you know, gathering insights from stakeholders and current market trends to ensure that the problem you're solving is truly a problem that needs solving. And when it comes to unmet clinical needs, this means experience, feedback and insights from clinicians and the clinical setting. Um, sometimes we see a lot of people doing the converse and that is creating a solution first and then trying to find a problem to solve. Um, and that process is actually riddled with lots of assumptions and you may end up with something that's not a good fit or an effective solution. So building a solution for a validated, identified and necessary problem um, will be a sure fit and probably one that you can build upon for success. success. Sorry, I've got a really squeaky chair. I'm just going to say it out loud. I don't know if everyone heard it earlier, so I'm going to mute myself. But thanks, Duncan. We're, we're not hearing the squeaky chair. It's all good, Dhammika. Look, a follow-up question to that. We're also looking for applicants to demonstrate a clear understanding of the value proposition of the pro proposed product. Can you give us a bit more detail about what that means? Yeah, okay. So I guess at Cicada Innovations, we believe that good ideas can come from anywhere. Um, but we do recognise that there are plenty of ideas out there and not every single one is going to be a business. And one of the first things that you do need to articulate when you're starting to think about an idea is your value proposition. And your value proposition is the reason why a user would turn to your solution over another. So it really solves your user's problem um, or satisfies whatever they need. Now, as with all good inventions, we need to validate, test, and understand where you fit in an ecosystem. Um, so for any product or service to be successful, there are sort of four core assumptions that should be true. The first is that the problem you are addressing is a meaningful one, that the second one is the solution you've chosen fixes all or part of the problem, 
The third is your product delivers the solution effectively. And the fourth is the market you have chosen wants to buy your product. Now, because we're talking clinical world, um, for that transition from idea to success, you also need to address different types of risks. So you've got clinical risk. Will, you know, will the innovation be accepted and adopted into a workflow and produce real improvements in outcomes or lower the costs? Uh, market risks, is there a significant unmet need with enough buyers to buy the innovation at a, a really good price or a sustainable price? There's regulatory risks, so what claims you need to prove and how long will that take and how much will it cost? Um, and of course, technical risks. So will the technology be protectable as well as work better than what's out there, but also at a better price um, than other alternatives? So it all ties in together. You can see that in order to deliver on your value proposition, you require a strong competitive advantage but you also need to ensure that you're truly solving um, the user's problem. Fantastic. Thanks for that really detailed answer, Tamik. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Ian, one of the five selection criteria relates to translation and commercialization potential. Can you give us a bit more information on what we're looking for when we ask for a feasible business model? Thanks, Duncan. Um, yeah, I think in, in simple terms, it, it really captures everything that, that Tamik has just covered. Uh, and articulates that in terms of what is the plan to actually put this in place and develop and have a successful business. Um, and um, and as, as you outlined before, it includes the, the IP protection, uh, the feasible business model and, and ensuring you're attractive to investors. And th this, this won't be new to, I'm sure everyone on, on the call, but medtech is a highly regulated industry. And that is, that is the real nuance or complication in here in terms of the business plans. And we, we need to see that there is, you have a clear understanding of those regulatory pathways and those regulatory risks that Dharmika mentioned. Um, understanding of that regulatory pathway and how that's going to be navigated. Then in terms of the end user, who is the end user? Who's going to pay for the product? And that quite often they can be different which is another complexity in terms of our reimbursement systems in Australia. So who's going to pay for the product? Why are they going to pay for that? Coming back to the value proposition. And how is that going to be paid for? And coming, as I said, we, we have a highly regulated industry in Australia and that, that complexity is about market access, but also how is it going to be purchased? How is it going to be reimbursed? And that differs between our public and private systems as well. Um, how are you going to access your customers? And what evidence do you have that um, they will pay for the product? Um, so quantification of the, that market, what's the size of that market? And what's the, the realistic penetration that you're going to achieve in that market? within feasible timelines. Um, ideally, if, if you're, you're engaging with surgeons who will be either a decision maker, a key influencer or a purchaser of, of your device, um, your application would include um, feedback and recommendations from, from those surgeons. Um, so I think, um, again, this won't be new, but uh, quite often regulatory and reimbursement pathways are not considered early enough. And uh, it, it can affect every single stage, including the, the design of clinical trials uh, and the data collection that's needed right from the start. Um, so if they're not addressed early enough, uh, that can place the whole project at significant risk, uh, even delay or even failure of the project. So the business plan needs to show that you have addressed each of those issues and show how you're going to make this a success. Fantastic answer. Thanks so much for that, Ian. That's, that's, it's a really uh, comprehensive overview. Linked to that, Andrew, another aspect that we look at is the team, their capabilities and access to infrastructure. Can you comment for us on what makes a good team? Sorry, Andrew, you're on mute. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, yes, of course, with, with respect to your team, it's important to show expertise across a number of domains that are important in commercializing medical devices. 
So not just R&D, like you might have in an NHMRC application, but uh, expertise in the clinical domain, um, regulatory, legal, definitely IP, and some track record in commercializing medical devices would also go a very long way. Um, so in your application, you should list all the key personnel, I think within your organization, but we acknowledge that you'll often use external advisors and consultants, that's not unusual um, in the commercialization of a medical device. So these would typically include a patent attorney, certainly a regular affairs consultant, and then perhaps a design house or a contract manufacturing organization and perhaps a clinical research organization if you're outsourcing the clinical trial. You may not have contracted or engaged these third parties yet, but if you haven't, you should flag that in your application um, and flag that you intend to engage them if successful with the funding application. I would like to point out that this section, like the others, is worth 20%. So I would encourage applicants to put in a, a similar amount of effort and comprehensive applications will be those that can articulate how their team's skill set and experience and diversity sets them up for success. And we know that um, diversity is something that small teams may not have at this point in time, uh, but no, you won't be penalized for that, but it is important in your application um, to describe any strategies that you have for increasing diversity within your team. Finally, I, I would say when you're describing the resources and the infrastructure that you have access to, if you've got something unique, really try and highlight that because that is something that will set you apart and act as a barrier to others that are trying to develop similar technology. So that is something that will make an application um, that bit stronger if you have unique infrastructure or capabilities. It's a, it's a really important point, Andrew. What we're really looking to see is things that are not me too or appear to be copying something else that's already in the market. We're looking for unique things. And if your product sounds similar to something else, really take the time to differentiate and maybe even call out and say, we are aware of product X, Y, and Z in, in production and we're different for these reasons. Um, I'd like to move now to some of the questions that have come through on the Q&A. We seem to have quite a few around the, the funding and the co-contribution. So that, that money, um, it, it cannot be, uh, Marcus has asked, for the cash co-contribution, is already dedicated or invested funds eligible or does it have to be new invested funds? No spending that occurs before the beginning of the program can be counted there. You're, essentially what we're looking for is cash in the bank that will be used for the project. Um, so no funding that occurs before it award will count uh, and it's just from that period on. Similarly, I have a question from, from Nick uh, asking about whether grants that have been awarded. Just Duncan, Duncan on, on that previous point, I think uh, the question was, um, alluding to um, raising new funds as a requirement. And I know the SA State Government had an innovation grant scheme that, and you were only eligible if you raised new funds. It wasn't money in the bank. Um, and that's not the case with CTCM, that, that you must be raising new funds, uh, just, just that you can get access to the cash somehow. Okay, thanks for that clarification, Andrew, appreciate it. Um, the, the other question that kind of relates to funding is whether grants that have been awarded to an SME can be considered as matched funding. Generally, the answer is going to be no. Generally, that grant will be awarded to do a particular project, uh, which will be distinct from what you're proposing to do in your CTCM program. There, there may be cases where you can, but it's, it's very, very unlikely. If you're unclear, the contact email address is ctcm at mtpconnect.org.au, but I think it would be incredibly unlikely. Uh, another funding question from Filippo, um, he's asked, is so up to 1.5 million from CTCM, 
one-to-one -one cash contribution from awardee. So the total of the proposed projects can be up to 3 million. The project can be as large as you need it to be to achieve what you want to achieve in the 24 months. If you are putting in a larger cash contribution, and I just want to clarify that it's 50%. So if you want to ask for a million dollars, you have to have five, a 500K cash co-contribution, not one-to-one, -one, but it can be larger. But the, the answer to the question is, the total value of the project can be as large as you need it to be to get done what you need to get done in the 24 month period. Um, Andrew, I have a question for you here from uh, Adrian. Um, will the project partner assigned at consultation perform a mentor role? From your experience with, with BTB and others, can you answer that for us, please? Yeah, I think if the awardee is receptive to that, it could certainly be a, a mentorship type role that the partner performs. It's not always something that would happen because some of the awardees um, being SMEs may be quite large companies that have been around for a few years. They might be public listed companies with uh, functional teams and, and lots of experience that don't need the mentorship. But often a, an awardee, the, the, the CEO may hand off responsibility within the organization to um, a more junior member of staff, a, a, a project manager, and that's, that's when it might be appropriate to perform that mentorship role and coach them perhaps in things like communication style for reports that are needed for this type of commercialization grant. So if the awardee is receptive to it, there's certainly an, uh, an aspect of mentorship that will happen, yes. And certainly, certainly part of the value of the program and the way that we've run it in the past and how we intend to run it again is access to the networks of MTAA MDPP, Cicada, of, of you, Darmaka, Andrew, and Ian. It, it is part of the value add and why we run it as we do. Um, I have a, a question from someone at Monash uh, who has asked whether they, as a, um, a, an employee of Monash University, were eligible to apply. The program is specifically for SMEs. Uh, as I said in the introduction, we responded to a call from the MRFF uh, and the guidelines in that funding opportunity said that this was a program for SMEs. So we expect that ap the lead applicant will be incorporated when they submit their EOI. The follow-up question from Tor um, around whether spin-outs are eligible. Yes, if, you've if you meet those eligibility criteria of an Australian company registered in Australia, with less than 200 employees, you are eligible to apply. Um, where should we move to next? Um, Ian, I have a question for you, uh, again from, from Marcus. He says, could you talk a little bit about the alignment with the modern manufacturing strategy and the national manufacturing priority roadmap for medical products? What does this mean for product development and looking for manufacturing and assembly partners does everything have to be manufactured in Australia, noting that we don't always have capability here? So two parts to the question. First of all, can you talk us through the modern manufacturing strategy and the national manufacturing priority roadmap as it relates to medical products? Uh, and then second of all, um, what does that mean for work doing, doing work in Australia? Uh, thanks, Duncan. And please jump in as well, Duncan and the fellow panellists on this one. Um, so, yes, the, um, the Modern Manufacturing Initiative and the strategy uh, is effectively a separate program. Um, I think it, it does align in terms of the broad objectives to be developing local manufacturing capability. Uh, and that has been a clear government policy objective uh, through that initiative and, and essentially through, through this program as well. Um, and, and sorry, the second part to the question, Duncan? Um, if you're not able to do some of your manufacturing in Australia, is that going to, uh, you know, do, do you have to do it here? Or if the capability doesn't exist in Australia, what, what can you do? Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong on this one in terms of the eligibility criteria, but the, um, uh, the majority would need to be uh, Australian based. Um, and if, if, some of that was overseas, 
I think that could fall within the scope, but the majority would need to be Australian based. Absolutely correct, Ian. So have a good look at the funding guidelines, Marcus, and see what you're planning to do. You don't have to do everything in Australia, and we recognise that some manufacturing won't be able to be done here, but there is a limit to how much work can be done overseas, which can be increased with consultation with MTP Connect and the Department of Health as the funder of the scheme. Um, Andrew, another question for you, uh, based on your role with MDPP. So the requirement of a 50% cash contribution, minimum 250K, is prohibitive for most medtech startup companies. Any suggestions or is the CTC program not suitable for startups? And Dharmika, I'm gonna ask you to, um, to talk to this after Andrew's answered as well. Uh, I hope it is suitable for startups, perhaps not all startups at the stage they're at. Um, BTB did fund some startups. Um, the, the question, I guess, the challenge for startups right now is, is getting commitments for that cash before the closing date for this round in March. It's a very short period of time, you know, raising private investment usually takes several months, I would say. So you might be better targeting round two, uh, which is in the second half of this year, I believe, Duncan. Um, but certainly the stronger, you know, the, the startups that um, are most competitive have been able to go out and raise the private investment funds that are needed um, to have that cash co-contribution. Fantastic, Andrew. And Dharmika, the follow-up question for you there is for companies that might be earlier stage or uh, don't have access to the cash, can you talk through some of the other programs that might be aware that you're aware of around the country that can support that earlier stage work? Yeah, sure. There are lots going on um, at the moment around the country. And I would encourage people to think about it as some of the things that I said earlier. So just trying to get that you know, validation around the problem you're solving and then understanding, um, I guess, the traction uh, is a big piece because it's all good coming with an idea, but you sort of have to have that engagement with stakeholders and bring that to the table so that there's a demonstrated effort of you understanding that your idea has some legs, but maybe not all the legs it needs to get to the next stage. And it just shows us that initiative that you've got to get going. Um, programs that can help you do this, some of the ones as part of the READY program that Duncan mentioned earlier. And I think, Lisa, you've got a question here that I saw there's lots of acronyms running around. Um, but I think, so the one that Sakhar is doing, which I'll quickly um, tack on uh, before I talk about some of the others, is all about that commercialization, early stage idea, validation, problem solve, you know, problem solution fit, all that stuff that I've been talking about. That's what we aim to do in our two day workshop. Um, I know that ARCs cover reg and clinical trials and all of those things really, really well in theirs. Similarly, SIA um, are working through uh, SIA Pharma, on, and I think the link is in the chat, are doing all the things around what we call quality management systems in the device world and all of those sorts of things. Even if you think I'm not at the stage where I need to know all this, it's still good to be across it so you understand and how to plan for your um, all the things that Andrew mentioned and Ian mentioned, you know, funding, planning that future strategy, all these sorts of programs are good sources of learning, knowledge, information, um, and the kinds of skills that you bring on board and just keep using as you, as you don't just do it once and then forget about it. You use it um, on and on and on and on. So we've also got the medical device, sorry, it's called something else now, the New South Wales Health Commercialization Training Program that we're running at Cicada. I know that uh, BioIntellect are doing their program as part of the um, Ready Initiative. There are so many, Duncan, you've put me on the spot with this heaps. Uh, Queensland, Bridge Tech, uh, MDPP's program. There are just so many opportunities for early stage ideas and people to engage with these groups, get some sounding, you know, some sounding board people in a row and get them to critically analyze you. And I know that sounds mean, but it really does tell you where the gaps are. Um, and allows you to really build out a strong, solid proposal or application for something like CTCM. Thanks so much for that, Dharmika. And look, I, I'm not sure where you're based, but I would also highlight the MTP Connect Stakeholder Engagement Team, myself in New South Wales ACT, uh, Andrew up in uh, Brisbane. Um, we now have Joe Close in Adelaide, 
uh, Tracy over in Perth and our Senior Director Beck Tunstall in Melbourne. If you need some, some pointers on where you might be able to access funding or, or help progressing your medical device program that might be a bit earlier, we can help you navigate um, that, that labyrinth and uh, explain some of the, uh, the acronyms that, that we use. <laughs> and, I, and I apologize to Lisa for that. Um, it's kind of second nature. Um, a question from someone in WA who says, looking at the partners, WA is not a part of MDPP, Cicada is Sydney based, and we're a medical device company, but not a member of MTAA. Is it worth applying? Absolutely, yes. MTAA is a national organisation. They are, they're, they're Australia wide. MDPP uh, is, is working Australia wide. Cicada more and more are working beyond New South Wales. But the point of the program is not where the, the consultation partners are based because anything that needs to be done can be done by teleconsultation. Um, so the fact that you're in WA, definitely it's valuable to apply. And we have certainly funded projects, uh, quite a few projects out of WA. So yes, some of the partners might be both based on the East Coast or, or in South Australia, but there is definitely no reason you're behind the eight ball. The project will be judged on its merits and based on your response to the selection criteria. So hopefully that answers that one. Just to add to that, Duncan. Oh, I was going to add to that too. Go for it. Ian, you go first. <laughs> After you, Dominica. Oh, thank you. I was just going to say, look, we actually see a lot of people coming through some of our programs, even if it's virtual. Um, the biggest thing I would say is that you're opening up doors interstate by engaging in these kinds of programs. So we connect a lot of people in other states to things that are happening in other states as well as New South Wales. And that's the, a major benefit that you may not see right up front. That's all I wanted to add. Ian, go for it. Thank you. Yeah, you took one of my points around accessing national networks, um, but also just to clarify in terms of MTAA membership, that's that's irrelevant um, as, a, as an organisation and, and our members, uh, they actively engage and we actively work with the industry as a whole. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lot of our members engage um, hands-on with uh, providing uh, technical assistance and mentoring or even take direct investment. So it's, this isn't a, a membership requirement. Thanks for that both. Um, we have a question from Andrew. Can the CTCM fund or contribute to clinical development program that is already underway or will the grant fund a portion of the development that has not yet started? So you can't start spending money until you're awarded a, a grant. So it might be that you're doing something and you will continue doing something between now and September, but you need to have a discrete project that can be reimbursed against milestones to, to, to be eligible. So hopefully that answers that one. Um, looking to see what else we have to respond to. Andrew, um, Philip Lewis has asked, does a clinical trial need to be fully completed within the project period? And you've indicated you'd like to answer that one. Yes, I would say not necessarily fully completed. It's often the case with clinical trials that um, follow-up assessments may go on for years, but there would need to be a, a meaningful sort of study endpoint within the time frame of the project. So a readout of something clinically very meaningful um, that would um, enhance the commercial commercialization prospects for your device. So not necessarily fully completed, but um, the study would have to generate important data that will um, en enhance your commercialization prospects. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, just going through some of the questions, uh, we have a question from, uh, Ching, I think is, is how it would be pronounced. So it's 50% of the grant money, not 50% of the total project value. That's correct. So the minimum cash co-contribution, if you want to ask for $1 million, is $500,000. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that. Um, Filippo has also asked, how important is local manufacturing of the proposed medical device? Will, will established plan with overseas manufacturing 
be considered. I think we've addressed that to some degree. It's likely to improve the, the, the competitiveness of your project if you are looking to do some part of the manufacturing onshore. We do recognise that it's not always possible for various reasons, um, but the expectation is that, that you will at least have some kind of justification for why you're planning not to do that. Will established plan with overseas manufacturing be considered? Yes, but there is a limit to how much you can spend overseas without a specific uh, approval from MTP Connect, which has to be sought from the Department of Health as the uh, purse holders of the MRFF funding. Um, let's see where we have next. A similar question around uh, from Esther. We have clinical trials in Australia that have been asked to do similar in the US. Again, there is a limit to how much money from, from the grant you can you, you can spend overseas. Um, so maybe, almost certainly not though. If if you need clarification, the contact email again is ctcm at mtpconnect.org.au. Um, Andrew, I'm going to pass this one to you again, given your uh, experience with previous applications. Does the contribution um, have to be cash in the bank at the time of award or at the time of EOI or full proposal? What's, what's the timing that we have there? Um, I, I would say it's better if it's committed at the time of the EOI. It's, it's possible that you could advance even if it's not committed. Uh, but you must have a strong letter of intent, something like that, to demonstrate uh, an interest in investment or some other form of evidence of, of being able to access the cash. If you progress beyond the EOI stage, you'd be invited to submit a full proposal. That's when the cash must be committed. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we have a similar question. Do you need to provide evidence of the committed match funding during the application process? I think we've just answered that one. Um, Lisa, so if you have... There's one, oh, sorry. There's one on software as a medical device that two people are wondering. So that's stream four, isn't it? It is. Look, I would encourage you to contact us via the email to get some further so we can have a bit more of a conversation about that. It, it's likely that that will be outside of scope where we're, the, the general expectation with this program is that there will be some sort of physical component, um, some sort of device included, but mm -hmm. worth contacting us to get clarification on that one, I think. Um, Andrew, another one for you because we've already had this conversation. Some comments on combination products, medical devices delivering medicine of some kind would be appreciated. Specifically, would they be eligible? Uh, look, if it's a specific drug device combination, um, I would say probably not, especially if it's a new chemical entity, you know, all the risk there is um, associated with the drug. Um, and the complexities of getting a, a drug to market and the timeframes and the cost involved that uh, moves it too far away, I think, from this medical device program. If it's a platform sort of drug delivery device that could deliver um, um, multiple drugs, uh, I think that might be something we would look at. I think, you know, we'd look at it on a case by case basis. And uh, I think I would encourage anyone who thinks they have a, a combination uh, product to contact MTP Connect before applying. Thanks, Andrew. I'm just looking at the chat and there's a comment from Neri Baker that says there's a question at the top of the list that seems to have been missed about TRL4. I can't actually see that question. Um, so if, if someone would like to, to re-enter that, that would be fantastic. Um, we have a question from Yan Ling. As part of the clinical sample assessment for the medical device, can the funding be used to access overseas biobank samples? Look, I can't see that being a, a hugely significant part of the project. Um, I can't see it being 
uh, sort of more than about 10%, which is, I think, the limit of the overseas um, spending. So, Yanling, I, I, I suspect you're going to be okay there, but if you'd um, like to discuss further, you know where to find me. Um, okay, I've, I can see the TRL question now. The technology must be at least TRL in four in terms of maturity. Would a project for adding a capability to an existing investigational device be eligible for the CTCM program? This would require prototype development and preclinical testing of the new feature. However, the existing investigational device has already been tested in clinical trials. I think, Andrew, you're, you're, you're shaking your head. Did you want to respond to that one? Well, just uh, from the sound of it, the, the, the proposed project does not involve a clinical investigation. Therefore, it would not be eligible. Fantastic. Yeah. Good answer. Thank you. Um, looking to see what else we haven't uh, addressed. Um, look, we, the question from Sam about getting a letter of intent within three to six months. So if, if you have a reasonable expectation that you, you might be able to get that, you can put in your EOI saying, explaining why you have that reasonable expectation before you go to full application, we would expect to see that. This, uh, this program has been open since December last year. Um, I think there's been a fairly significant period of time. Um, the underlying logic in requiring a cash contribution for this particular grant, we want to see that it's, it's a supported program um, that there is buy-in from someone who's willing to put additional cash in. And also we want to use that federal money to leverage additional investment. Um, a similar question about the ratio of cash contribution impacting the score of the application. Uh, generally, if there's more ca cash contribution, it can be seen as more favorable to a degree. Um, if you're planning to do a $20 million project and you're, you've got a cash contribution of $20 million and you're asking for 1.5 million, it looks like the project is going to happen regardless of your um, of whether or not you get the, this project. So very often a larger contribution is seen as favorable uh, to an extent. Um, look, we've got a note of a question about uh, at the top about the details and policy for how community consumer stakeholders are being to be engaged in the work. I'm going to take that one on, on notice. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, depth to be delved into there. We will uh, respond to you, Claire, via email, if that's okay. Um, what else do we have to address? I think we're, we're getting towards uh, a number of um, questions that are a repetition. Andrew, Ian, Dharmaka, do you see any that you think we should be addressing? Uh, there's one right at the end there, Duncan. Would access to infrastructure such as 3D printing equipment to develop multiple new devices be considered eligible? Absolutely, yeah. It, you know, accessing short-run manufacturing facilities, particularly in Australia, is something that I think would be quite common in these proposals and would absolutely be eligible. With the caveat, of course, that the program does have to do some form of clinical testing. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Look, I think to, to a large degree, we have answered most of the questions. Um, where, where you think we haven't, where we will save all of these questions uh, and come back to anyone who is, has left a name that we can respond to via email. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen again. All right, bear with me for one second. So look, I just, just reiterate that um, where, where, we believe, where you believe we haven't answered your question uh, to your 
satisfaction, um, you can contact us at ctcm at mtpconnect.org.au where we can identify where a question has come from that we haven't answered. We will respond. So Claire, we will get something to you uh, regarding your question. Um, I'd like to thank our panel members, Ian, Andrew and Damika for their time. Uh, and I'd also really like to thank uh, Libby, Danielle and Kevin who've done all the work in the background to make this uh, webinar work. Um, we're probably going to finish a few minutes early. Um, I would just thank you all for joining us uh, and staying with us for the full, uh, for, for the full webinar. Um, would ask that you click the survey link that will appear when you log out. It's anonymous and it's really quick and it helps us improve these kinds of events in the future. Um, would encourage you to keep an eye on the MTP Connect Twitter feed and LinkedIn feed. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, we will provide the, the, um, the slides and access to an on-demand webinar um, via email, as well as details of how you can access the various ready programs. So with that, I thank you all uh, and wish you all a fantastic day. Thank you.